In this video, I'm describing the physics of a laser, but I'm going to carefully tell you um, that I'm describing the successful design of a laser that produces a continuous, steady beam. Um, so, uh, for example, what I'm talking about is a laser so this is a little laser device, and if you have a little button on the top, and when you push down on this button, it produces the beam, and this beam is on for as long as you hold down the button. There actually are lasers that don't operate this way, and it's not necessarily true to describe those lasers as not being successful. Um, but the laser that you're used to, that you can buy at the grocery store, is a, a laser uh, with a continuous steady beam. These other lasers, like when you push the button, um, you, you have to wait a little bit, and then all of a sudden you get this gigantic, highly energetic, but very, very short time duration uh, burst where the, the light comes out, um, all happening within, say, a millisecond, but you get an intense, super high energy density, little coherent laser beam. It's just very, very short, right? And then you have to wait for a little while, and then you can, uh, say, push the button again, and you get another burst. It's sort of like a flash lamp where the light is all laser light, so coherent, monochromatic, polarized, unidirectional, etc. But what I'm going to describe is what you might describe as the successful design of a continuous steady laser. And in particular, I'm describing the helium neon laser, the Heaney laser, if you want to be cute. It's called the helium neon laser because the materials that are necessary to have this laser are helium atoms and neon atoms. So you'll recognize that helium and neon atoms, both of them are noble gas atoms. So if you take these atoms and you put them in some sort of tube that, the, that, the, that traps these atoms, the idea is, is for every nine helium atoms, so there's four, five, Whoops. Yeah, there's going to be a neon. So there's five heliums, uh, six heliums, seven heliums, eight, nine, ten. Right? Um, there's not just, so in any particular helium, um, so in any particular he helium neon laser, it's called a gas lamp laser, right? Because these are gas atoms. Um, you don't just have 10 total atoms, of course. You have, uh, I don't know how many atoms you have, but you, you've got to have quite a lot. I, I don't know if it's a mole of atoms, you know, t six times 10 to the 23. I don't know if it's a gram. Maybe it's uh, a milligram or a microgram. Um, you, you don't actually want this area maybe to have so much density, right? You want kind of long spaces um, between the atoms inside of the uh, gas of helium and neon. Um, but let me just say that as you're designing your laser, uh, the truth is, is you have to take this into account. The question is, is what's the density of atoms, right? And this is an engineering question. And it's a, you know, at, at base, it's really also a, a physics question, but... Um, but the point is, is relative densities, it's about nine to one, right? So for every 10 atoms, one of them is a neon and nine of them are heliums. Um, that, yeah. So, okay. Um, so this turns out to be a pretty good formula to follow. Um, and before I get started in actually describing the physics of the helium neon laser, which is very quantum mechanical, you'll see that basically it's going to look like all I'm talking about is atomic energy level transitions. 
but um, right, and they are quantum mechanical. Uh, but let me let me say very quickly, so that you have s sort of a ball to watch, right? Something in particular to watch for. You should watch for the fact that the atoms that actually produce the laser light. So I told you that this laser is actually a red beam, right? I think the the wavelength is about 600, 632.8 nanometers, right? That's that's a red visible wavelength color. This particular wavelength, it comes from neon. It, it comes from the neon atoms. It does not come from the helium atoms. Um, so that being said, I need nine helium atoms for every one neon. Uh, the helium atoms play an extremely important role in being able, being able to have a continuous steady laser, right? Um, yeah. So here we go. First important uh, piece of physics. is stimulated emission. All right. So stimulated emission leads to copies, right? And copies, right, copies of photons. And this is the laser beam, right? This is the reason why the laser beam is special. You'll I hope that makes sense from the previous video. Um, so stimulated emission is the first uh, important piece of physics. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, it means the following thing. If I have an atom, so I'm going to leave this atom unidentified, but this atom is excited, then what can happen is if this atom, right, has a transition available to it. Um, actually, let, let me let me put it this way. So I have an atom that's excited, and I actually have another atom that's excited the same way. If this atom spontaneous, so check this out. This is a different word, spontaneous, right? So spontaneous emission. What's spontaneous about this is the direction and the phase. So anyways, so let's say that accidentally, randomly, right, spontaneous means random, um, a photon comes away from this excited atom. So here is that little photon, and it's headed away. So if that happens, then this photon is no longer excited. It goes down to some lower energy level, right? Maybe the ground state or maybe some uh, slightly less excited state. But anyways, I get this emission, right? This photon travels past, so let me um, capture it real quick. So I'm going to place it here. So here it is now. And this photon is passing this similarly excited other atom and stimulated emission is the situation, is the quantum mechanical thing that happens if you have this photon pass by an atom that could also release that photon, then that atom has a very large probability of going ahead and doing so. And the photon that it emits looks the same in all regards, direction, polarization, phase, and frequency as the first. So now you have two atoms left over that neither of them are excited, so neither of them can continue to produce that same photon, but you've got two of those photons that are copies, right? And now each of these photons, the idea is these photons are gonna pass by other atoms that are down the line that are excited, right? And these two photons are going to create copies of themselves. So one photon became two, is going to become four. And this process 
is called lazing. Right? So this is the lazing process. It's a cascade of copying. Okay. Here's a problem. Let's say that I've got, say, a couple of copies of photons cruising along. Right? So if they were to instead pass by an atom that's not excited. And let's say that this process up here was from, you know, the excitation was going away and in, in place you have an, an unexcited atom and a photon. What if the result of releasing the photon was to put the atom at the ground state? So the problem with that is if your atoms end up in the ground state, so GRND for ground, then this atom is opaque to one of the laser photons. That is, this photon is going to cruise up towards the atom. This atom in the ground state has a pretty good probability of absorbing it. And so... If there are atoms in the ground state, then what they can do, actually, is reabsorb the photon. So the photon disappears and gets reabsorbed by an atom. And meanwhile, all of the good laser photons, they disappear and leave the, atom, or the, the space. And this atom, instead of kicking out another photon in the same direction, kicks it out in another direction because it's another spontaneous, unstimulated emission, right? And so the problem is, is if your atoms produce a laser transition such that your atom ends up in the ground state, then, then you can't have a continuous laser. Because every time you produce a laser, that laser actually gets eaten back up by the atoms in the ground state. So what you really want, right? So um, a more successful laser um, can be made from atoms where after a laser transition, the atom is not, oops, not in the ground state. It's in some uh, lower excited state. And that's what neon does. Neon, at neon atoms do this, right? And this is pretty cool. So here's a um, very basic uh, energy level diagram for neon. So energy level diagram uh, for neon, right? So let's do this over here. Um, the neon ground state is down at 2p. So this is the lowest state. This is ground, the ground state. Um, there is a slightly excited level called the 3s state, right? So principal quantum number n is 3. It's a little bit above the 2. There is a, another excited state that's interesting called the 3p level. So 3p is slightly higher energy than 3s. And then there is another, so we're skipping uh, principal quantum number four. It's, it's there, but we don't need to inspect it. Um, there is a 5S state. So here is the ground state level, 2P, for a neon atom, right? We're talking about neon right now. 
And um, here is um, what can happen. So this transition right here for neon, if a neon was way, way up in this high excited energy level state, this transition right here is the laser transition. Is that true? Actually, let me let me quickly look. Yeah, so what I said was correct. So um, so the neon energy level diagram has all of these levels where 2p is the ground. That's the bottom. And the 5s level is about, I think it's about 21 electron volts higher Right, it's about 21 electron volts higher than the ground state. Okay, so if a neon atom was to show up in this very excited state, so um, let's change colors. So if the neon atom shows up in this excited state, then one of the transitions available to it is to drop down to the 3p. Um, and this actually is our laser transition. Um, after a neon atom does that, it's still actually excited because now it's at the 3p level, which is still above the ground state. So actually, the neon is going to... F so after a neon atom actually releases one of the laser photons, right, either spontaneously, honestly, or by stimulated emission, um, the neon atom still has a few levels to drop. So it's going to drop from 3p to 3s and actually release a photon. But that photon is just a reason for the neon atom to glow. It's not part of the laser. And it can also drop, well, it is going to also drop from 3s down to 2p. So these are two uh, fairly infrared photons, maybe. Uh, I don't actually know what the energies will be. But um, Anyhow, they're not part of the laser, but they are photons that are emitted as neon relaxes all the way back down to the ground state. So here, why do we have helium? The reason we have helium, helium is going to act as a pump. It's going to, in a sense, be a pump that causes neon to have this extremely... Um, somewhat high excited state above the ground. Um, honest, like just um, because of thermal interactions or just the, the most likely excited state for neon, if neon was all by itself, was actually just to show up here. This is the nearest excited state, or actually, sorry, not that one. This one. This one is probably the most excited, um, the, the nearby highly probable excited state for neon. So if neon is, is sort of jostled or somehow gains energy, it's likely just to gain this energy and then transition here and you see these photons. Um, the neon doesn't necessarily all by itself generate this, this kind of photon, the laser photon, or, or even, even spontaneously. So the requirement of ha having helium around is the fact that helium's ground state is 3s1, right? Helium's a simple atom. It's only got two electrons. So, uh, shoot, I, I did that wrong. So um, helium's ground state, yes, so it's 1s. Uh, I'm really bad at using this program. So 1s, right? It's just the, that's the ground state of helium. And the very next level is the 2s. And the, it turns out that the 2s level is 21 electron volts from the ground. And the reason why that's important is this energy difference between adjacent levels for helium 
is the same as the energy difference that takes me from the ground state of neon to the particular interesting excited state that can have this um, laser transition. So the idea is, if you have a helium atom and it's inside of this gas lamp, right, this gas chamber, if you take electrodes such that you can liberate little free electrons, the free electron comes across with a big kinetic energy and rams into this helium. They have a collision. And the effect of that collision is the electron slows down. Now you have an electron with less kinetic energy, less momentum. So let me draw it that way. So we don't have this high kinetic energy electron anymore. And instead what we have is an excited state helium. And that excited state helium is maybe moving, right? So it's moving along and there is a neon in the ground state somewhere nearby, right? The thing about this state right here is it's long lived against spontaneous emission. Like the helium could actually at some point release a photon associated with this energy difference, you know, which would be uh, probably out of the visible wavelength. Or actually I should check that, but it, it emits a single photon, right? That's one of the ways it can do it, but it is actually, it's gonna take a long time in a sense. And the reason it takes a long time is because there is a selection rule that delta L needs to either be plus or minus one. And you can see that L is zero in both cases. So this transition as a spontaneous emission violates the selection rule. What that means is it lives a long time. It just takes a long time for it to happen. It's got a very low probability, a very high half-life, right? So this helium atom can actually wander for a long time. It can, do, it can be in this excited state for a very long time because it takes a long time to spontaneously emit it. But you can have a bump between the helium and the neon atom. And what happens is that energy, the excited helium loses the excitation and bounces the neon or pumps the neon up to, up, oh, shoot, um, this excited state and now i have this neon and the thing about this neon is it is something of a metastable state and if this process continues right metastable means it also lasts somewhat of a long time then what you can have i'm just going to draw the neons now is you have a bunch of neon atoms and more of them are in this upper state than in the ground state, right? Um, and actually more of these neon atoms are in this upper state compared to this state. This state um, quickly decays. This state doesn't live a long time. If it did live a long time, then if one of these neons was in that um, state, then as a photon, a laser photon passed by it, that neon could reabsorb it, right? This neon atom could reabsorb this laser transition photon and just bounce right back up to the uh, 5s excited state so it doesn't live a long time so mostly what you have in the neon gas is either excited state neons or you have ground state neons that's typically the population and in particular because you have the excited state neons let me remove this laser photon um, this is called a population inversion
all right? So the population inversion is the fact that you have more excited state, and I'm talking 5S excited state, right? 5S is the special top of the laser transition state. So more excited state at 5S than ground state. All right? Um, so you, what you have is you have a whole bunch of neon atoms that are ready to laze. They're ready to contribute to the beam. So um, here's the idea. You put some mirrors that are partial, right? So they transmit, say, 50% and reflect 50%. And you put a similar mirror back here, or maybe you put a 100% reflector as much as, or whatever that means. And so if, if one of the mirrors is partial, then that's the mirror that the laser beam is going to come out of, right? It's going to come out of this one. So all you need in this case is you have a population inversion. One of the neon atoms releases its photon, laser transition photon. So it, it's just a spontaneous emission. If that emission is along the axis between the mirrors, then this laser, right, comes from this atom. So this atom, it, it de-excites, and this photon moves across, and with this uh, neon atom, now you're gonna have two photons, right, that are copies of each other. So let me remove it, because it's moved over to here. So these neon, at, uh, these uh, photons, they're heading towards the mirror, and one of them can go through, but the other is going to bounce back. And when it bounces back, here it comes. It's going to run past another one of the neons in the population inversion. And that neon is going to lose its excitation and spit out a photon. And you get a cascade running in the opposite direction. Meanwhile, the heliums are continuing to be excited and continuing to re-excite the neons. And what happens because of the, the mirrors is the chamber is flooded with photons either heading towards the left or towards the right. And each of these photons is a copy of each other. And because you continue to maintain, continue to pump energy in, to re-exciting heliums, right, up to the special 2S excitation level so that it can continue to bump or pump the neons from ground up to that special 5S excited state, maintain the population inversion, then all you're going to do is generate uh, these, these photons. Now, the really cool thing is even if a neon atom shows up in its ground state. So here is a neon atom in the ground state. A laser photon coming by. This photon is part of the laser. This neon atom in the ground state, which is here, can't do anything with that laser photon. The laser transition is hidden from the ground state. The only way that you can have the laser transition is you start in the 5S or you start in the 3P. The 5S is long-lived, metastable, but the 3P quickly decays very fast to 3S to 2P. So what this means is, is the laser action is a continuous, steady uh, beam producer. Okay, so um, a lot of details. There's only a few sort of basic steps here. Um, the the cascade of a laser is the result of a a couple of um, pretty interesting things working together. Um, this video is, yeah, it's not it's not that cleanly made. Um, the ideas are in here, 
what you should do is you you should sit down and and you know maybe try to recreate some of these arguments uh, from from the beginning. Imagine you have a glass tube full of individual helium and neon uh, atoms. You understand the basic process of stimulated emission. That just happens on a per atom basis. The stimulated emission happens between energy levels in an energy level diagram. So maybe redraw this diagram very carefully. Um, you know the laser transition is this 5s to 3p. And you know what you could do is you could say that when a neon atom is the ground state, why don't you color it green? And when a neon atom is in the 3s excited state, maybe color it purple. In the 3p excited state, call it yellow. And in the 5s excited state, call it red. And you can imagine saying, okay, so what if a helium bumps into a neon? Then the neon shows up. The neon becomes 5s excited state neon from 2p ground state neon, right? So you can color code your, your atoms. You could say that, right, for example, this neon atom is a ground state, and this neon atom um, right here is a one that's ready to contribute to the laser, right? Um, maybe this neon atom right here at the moment that you're thinking about it, the moment you're considering what it can do, maybe it's a... Um, one of the yellows, right? One of the other states. Color it yellow. And imagine what happens as a laser photon passes by it. As a laser photon passes by it, actually, that yellow could reabsorb. The thing is, is we need the laser photon to pass by it during its lifetime, but its lifetime is so short, like nanoseconds short. So actually, this doesn't get to exist in that... Uh, very quickly, very quickly, it actually turns purple. Right, so this atom that was yellow turns purple instead, and very quickly also it turns green by emitting a, another photon. Right, so there are these transitions that happen in between, and it becomes a ground state, and then a helium bumps into it, and instead of um, becoming yellow or uh what was the other color? Purple, it becomes red, right? Because that's what happens when a hel an excited helium um, hits a ground state neon. Oops. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think you get the idea. But this is the game you play. And as you play this game, um, knowing something about the lifetimes, right? The quick decays, the long, stable, metastable decays, super long-lived, Right, all this plays into your engineering decisions. Like, what do you need to be the distance between adjacent helium atoms on average? What do you need to be the distance between a helium, like a potentially excited helium, and a ground state neon? Right, that's going to speak to, say, how big you make this area and how many overall atoms you have inside the, the gas, right? Um, you can make some engineering decisions this way. And then you go and you basically, you, you could just do experiments. Let me add 2,000 more heliums and just see what happens. Do I get a better laser or a less good laser, you know? Okay. Um, Thanks for listening. This was long-winded.